Our special guest today on the red couch is none other than Professor Sir Henry Fraser. Sir Henry needs little introduction, I believe, to the local audiences, perhaps to our international audiences. Um, he is the retired Dean of Medicine at the University of the West Indies. For many years, he was the orator for the UWI. He is also a painter, a sculptor, a writer, a publisher. Um, he's done all kinds of things. Tell me a little bit about, tell our audience rather, a little bit more about Henry Fraser, where you grew up, um, where you went to school. Uh, what was what was life like for you as a young a young teenager? I went off to law school at a very young age. My mother taught us all. And her knee literally when the post office was quiet for four hours every day, between 10 and two, things were quiet. And that was where we got our primary school education. So I went off to law school. And I, would, I went to law school when my father's former boss had a son who had just won the Barbados scholarship. And so I went to school with the dictum. My father said, if he can win a Barbados scholarship, then so can you. And I was very much aware that the only way I'd ever get to go to any university long before the UWI, or we were aware of it anyway, was if I won a Barbados the scholarship. So that was my goal in life, and it turned out to be not too difficult. I won a Barbados scholarship and went off to Jamaica to become a West Indian. And part of your training also took you to the, to the UK too as well. Well, I went off to the UK to do a physiology degree in order to get away for a while because of my fair blood and my dis dislike of my first visits to the hospital. I, I was lucky, I was taught by a very eccentric professor, a friend and I, we were taught how to study effectively. And so the two of us won almost all of the prizes and as the top students we were advised to go to Britain so that we could do the kind of degree that would make us academics, teachers and researchers. So my first degree in London was doing studying physiology, the mechanisms of how the body works, and how things work in science. And then I went back, Maureen and I got married in Barbados. I came home to do my first year of research because I assumed that my academic life and my research would all be done in Jamaica because there was nothing much going on in Barbados with the university in that era. There was certainly no medical teaching down here, but I came home to do my internship in order to give a year, at least a year back to Barbados. And on my first day of work, I met my wife, you see. On your first day at work? On my very first day in the hospital, I walked into the hospital and there was this woman who turned out to be my wife. But that's another story and I don't think I'll go into that here. <laughs> you know, it has a lot. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say, why not? <laughs> why do you think Barbadians, who are reputedly some of the best educated people in the region, why do you think there's so many people that are so reticent about getting the vaccine? This era of those several years has created total confusion about what is true and what is false. And during that period, there developed a massive output of conspiracy theories and downright lies of all kinds. The second thing is in relation to vaccines. There was a dishonest doctor, Dr. Wakefield, many years ago, and he still has some followers, you know? <laughs> um, all kinds of crazy people and dishonest people have their followers. But this Dr. Wakefield created, wrote, published a paper claiming that the vaccine given to infants was the cause of autism. It was subsequently shown that he'd made a mistake. It was a fake, it was a scam. But it got so much publicity that it created a sense of distrust about vaccines, which is a, a real shame because vaccines are the safest medicines in the world. I mean, all sorts of medications that are taken orally or by intravenous injection have adverse effects, but vaccines have virtually none apart from the sore arm that you might get and the initial fever due to the immune response stimulation which gives you a fever and with the fever you may get a headache and feel tired and so on. So the immediate effects of the first day or two, those are the effects of vaccines. Added to that is the distrust that people now have of authority, the distrust of government, the distrust of politicians 
the distrust of authority figures. I'm told I look like an authority figure. I'm an old whitish looking man, so with a medical degree, many degrees. So I'm an authority figure. So I fall into that category of the establishment. I am not one of the people on the block who are down to earth, honest people. And the irony is that the people on the block, everybody's a doctor in Barbados now. So the people who are not doctors, are no longer trusting doctors. So how many priests and doctors and communicators and David Ellis's and prime ministers may not be, do we need to talk one-on-one -on -one to the entire population of Barbados in order to get people to behave in the normal, logical, sensible way that they used to behave? I sympathize with the people who don't have the information and I sympathize with the people who are not intelligent enough to understand the information. I have no sympathy as a doctor but I really do feel that individuals have a responsibility to protect not just themselves, if they don't want it, but to protect their family, their children, their parents, and the people that they network with. I want to switch it up a little bit and go straight to what has been a bit of a controversial sort of um, issue in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and that is the uh, handing over of something I know you had asked for for some time, the Glendary prison. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that one of our um, uh, senators mm -hmm. has said that it should be raised to the ground because it was a place of torture. I think it's important for a variety of reasons. First thing is the actual structure. There are five complexes there, the biggest building of which is the most magnificent building in Barbados. There's no question about it. Glendary Prison is really a Georgian style building. It's got 72 Roman arches along the west facade, which is almost 100 yards long. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Three stories of these Roman arches. People who go in there simply gasp because the majority of us have never had the privilege of being a guest of Her Majesty's Prison. Thank so you. we've not seen it, yeah. you know, we don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. The point is that people love prisons. That's the second point. People have a fascination with prisons. The third point is what's happened around the world. Every prison in the world has been dealing for 100, 200, 300 years with prisoners in which there would have been enormous cruelty, deprivation, even sodomy and other things. There's nothing. Nothing unique happened at Glendary. What happened at Glendary, up until very recent times as well, happened all over the world. But there are 110 prison museums in the world. And wherever they are, they are the biggest attraction and the biggest money earner of all visitor sites in that city or state. Professor Sir Henry Fraser, um, I knew this would be fascinating and I knew my work would be extremely simple today, um, that I would just have to turn the switch and uh, that Sir Henry would give us a, a body and a wealth of, of information. Um, and I certainly hope that we can draw on that uh, well of knowledge um, again at some time in the not too distant future.